Welcome, everyone, to episode 134 of Cocktail Hour. I'm Andy. Uh-oh, we're not hearing Sherry. Uh-oh. <laughs> Technical Stop. difficulties already. So You're we'll just... bypass her. Who else is here? Oh, well, this is Colette Moody. So, Yay. Sherry, are you for real or are you just pretending? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. yeah. Now yes, we can hear you. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All kinds of awesome. So we are actually not only here to talk about a book, but surprisingly, we're also here to talk about a new cocktail. How long has it been since we've actually had a new cocktail? Go away, whoever you are. Um, how long is mm -hmm. So how long, has it, how long has it been since we've actually, you know, had a cocktail? And then, wait, there's more. Of this is audible. No. <gasps> <laughs> About technical difficulties. Where is iTunes? Yeah, stop that. Stop Don't that. listen. Stop. That's our next book. Don't listen. Don't listen. Anyway, so we're having an actual alcoholic version of the drink, and we're having a virgin version of the drink. So, yay. Because I'm a virgin. Like a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> so, the drink today is. Uh, Really kind of cool, and Colette suggested it, and I brewed it up, and it's ready to go, but I haven't tried it yet. It's called uh, Redbird's Black Eyed Susan Cocktail. It's got rye whiskey, and um, we substitute. I substituted the dry carousel for Grand Marnier, um, emulsified pineapple because I couldn't find pineapple gum syrup, fresh lemon juice, Angostura bitters in a giant glass and um, I use my uh, cup from Vegas. So there you go. <clears throat> how, how did yours get changed up, call it? Um, so yeah, I couldn't find dry Curacao within like 200 miles. <laughs> I, you know, cause we can only get liquor in Virginia through the ABC store. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't buy liquor anywhere else. So, but I mean, the one thing that's convenient about that is I can just type in what I want and see what store near me has it. And yeah, nobody near me has it. But once I read what it basically was, I mean, it, it's an orange liqueur, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking, all mm -hmm. right, you could probably use Cointreau or Grand Marnier or a triple sec. I mean, there's lots of options. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, mine has Cointreau. Um, and then instead of the pineapple gum syrup, I was just going to use pineapple juice until I realized that it had expired. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this is really a completely different drink. No, I guess. <laughs> this is really what I needed. Um, yeah. So I ended up using, um, a mixer that I had in the fridge that uh was like uh pineapple and some other kind of i think pineapple grapefruit mm -hmm. All right. mixer oh and meyer lemon right so yeah, it was one yeah. of one of those um mixer syrup mixers that i got at williams sonoma comes in the big jar yeah. and you just yeah. dump it into look liquor mm -hmm. um yeah. so then i got the lemon juice and the angostura bitters and i think she said she added like a little bit of rum infused honey Mm. Oh, interesting. Or a little bit of sweetness, because uh, yeah, yeah, because I mean, I can't. I feel like I'm completely hijacking this. But um, so when we went to Hawaii, one of the places that we went was Manulele Distillery, mm -hmm. and one of the things that they sell is honey that has been aged in the rum casks. Oh, oh wow. I was thinking maybe they got some drunk bees. Got the bees <laughs> drunk on rum, right? And then, then you get the honey, which I think might be better. Well, I, I find even sober bees to be somewhat unpredictable. Wow. I hope that everybody got to see that. <laughs> Woo! Wow. So you're, so you're enjoying it, is what I can tell. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that rye whiskey punches you right in the puss, man. Wow. <laughs> What kind of rye are you using? <laughs> God dang. I don't remember. It's downstairs. I don't remember. Something okay. that uh, the liquor store suggested. I'm like, a decent rye that won't bankrupt me. He's like, this one. I don't oh, know. All right. Red Bridge, Red Burn, Red. I don't know what the hell it was. 
<clears throat> okay, it's, 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 it's actually, I'm starting to like it. It just took, I just did not, the ride just, like I got cartoon slapped. Okay. Very nice. All right, the more I drink it, the more I like it. I can taste all of the, I can taste everything distinctly, which is kind of interesting. Because the fresh lemon juice, the fresh pineapple, the bitters, the rye. And I actually, well, yeah, a little bit of orange hint with the Grand Marnier. Mm -hmm. It's good. After I made that crazy fucking face. Twice. Mm. Twice. No, more yeah, than that. Like <laughs> I'm very expressive. You are. I am. I can't you get away are. with nothing. I can't get me away. Uh -huh. Been that way growing up, too. Mom would be like, you do something? No. No, <laughs> you did. You did something. Totally yeah. believable. Totally I have the same believable. problem. That's why I'm not a professional poker player. <laughs> you too. You huh? know, you you get the cards and it's like, <gasps> oh. <laughs> Everybody folds. <laughs> like, yeah. Hell no. Oh, God, that's awesome. All right. So, Sherry, what are you drinking? What's yeah. the Virgin Eye uh, edition? Well, I only found one recipe, and it wasn't really a recipe. It just said um, pineapple juice, orange juice, and lime juice. So um, I went from there, and we ha already had a pineapple, so I cut that up and threw so threw a bunch of it in the in the blender with a bunch of uh, orange juice and half a squeezed lime, and um, blended that all up together and. Um, it was super thick, like a smoothie. So then I yeah. added um, seltzer, uh, seltzer oh, nice. water, and nice. some ice, and it thinned it up nice. It's got a nice color and a really good yep. flavor. Yeah, I think yeah. I might have maybe a little more lime juice uh, next yeah. time, but even even the kid liked it. So it sounds summery and and light. It's almost like a like a big popsicle, like a oh, big nice. juice sickle. It's it's really it's very good. Very good. And lots of vitamin C. Yeah, man. You got some test strips. You might want to check your blood sugar after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, goodness gracious. This is good. Now, the reason why, well, <clears throat> one of the reasons why Colette suggested this drink, not only because it sounded interesting and good, but because it kind of followed maybe a theme of an old South, like an old Southern recipe. And that leads us right into the book that we're going to be reviewing, which is going to be all kinds of spoilers because it's been around for decades. It's not a new book. It's called Kindred by Octavia E. Butler. And um, I actually uh, finished it up yesterday. So it's all fresh up in here. Mm -hmm. Me too. Finished yeah. it yesterday. Um, I finished it about 15 minutes ago. Excellent. Oh, wow. What? Okay. So we're yeah, all fresh. I had a week. Yeah, we're refreshed. We're refreshed, all right. All right. We're getting more, more refreshed as the time goes on. <laughs> I think that's really different. I, I don't think that that's... I agree. Thing. All right, so I will um, pull up the uh, the blurb, unless somebody just wants to wing it. No, I think the blurb would be good. All right, excellent. Absolutely, because this is a... This is an... I got to tell you, it, it was not exactly what I expected, but it's it's got some gut punches in it. Mm -hmm. um, it really does. And I might have to read some more of this author's work because I think she did a very good job uh, with this story. And and the fact that um, I think there's a graphic novel made out of it. Now? Is that there is. Yeah. Yep. That's so if, yep. Hmm. I mean, it's amazing if you think about it. This story was written uh, when 1979. Uh, 76. Think, uh, oh, no, hold on. It takes place. It, it um, may have been published in 79. I have yeah. a feeling that she was probably writing it during oh, yeah. no, the, first. Ini the initial era of... of <laughs> um, in, in all candor. So I, I've been aware of Octavia Butler, right? Um, and I knew that she had died not too, too long ago. But... I thought that this book was newer mm -mm. than it is. No, um, is so when I, when I started reading it, right, and said, so like, the, the main protagonist is, is a black woman 
married to a white man in 1976. My first thought was, wow, why did she put it in the 70s? That's a shitty time to be in an interracial marriage. And then when I actually did research on her, I was like, oh, that was when she wrote it. (laughs) (laughs) My bad. My bad. Yeah, okay. yeah, June of seventy nine. So yeah, June was the first release. Yeah. 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 So she was probably <laughs> writing it in the in seventy six, <laughs> seventy seven, seventy eight yep. era yep. era. So yeah. Okay, so um, the first science fiction written by a black woman, Kindred, has become a cornerstone of Black American literature. Uh, This combination of slave memoir, fantasy, and historical fiction is a novel of rich literary complexity. Having just celebrated her 26th birthday in in 1976, California, Dana, an African-American woman, is suddenly and inexplicably wrenched through time into antebellum Maryland. After saving a drowning white boy there, she finds herself staring into the barrel of a shotgun and is transported back to the present just in time to save her life. During numerous such time-defying episodes with the same young man, she realized the challenge she's been given, to protect this young slaveholder until he can father her own great-grandmother. That was a good summary, actually. Yeah, much better than we probably could have done. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was shorter than what we probably could have done. And much less rambly. Oh, uh, yeah. well, you know, sometimes a rambly is good. Sometimes. Yeah. I think she wrote some vampire books, too. Like, I think... Um, yeah, that's the thing. Books. Like, if you look at what she's written, she's kind of been all over the place. And uh, this... Uh, so, I don't feel like this was science fiction. Like, I get that there's time travel. Yeah. But in no other aspect of this book is there anything resembling science fiction. And... I don't know. I, I, to me, it, I, maybe it's just an uh, argument about semantics. But did this feel like a science fiction book to you guys? No, only only the time travel. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think of anything else that no. that would have been. Yeah. So, the, so like the in that time. way, it made me happy because you know science fiction is not well. my genre of choice. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if you look at other stuff that Octavia Butler's written, she's yeah, she's got vampire books and she's got like actual hardcore sci-fi. Um, so she's kind of all over the place, and good for wow. her. Yeah. Any, yeah. Idea, <laughs> any idea how many books she's written? Shitloads. But <laughs> it's so scientific. I know. Well, you know. Oh, before, um, I just want to say hi to our viewers. Hello, viewers. Oh, hey, viewers. Woo-hoo! I feel like she also wrote some short fiction, but I could be wrong. <laughs> okay, so I went to Google, the, <laughs> book, the book of Google, and oh, typed God. in how many books did Octavia Butler write? And the answer is at least five. Oh, well, well that's not know. helpful, Google. Yeah. I, I mean, I could have ballparked that. Oh, I think Fledgling is the one that I was thinking of that is the vampire book. New novel after seven year break is the story of an apparently young amnesiac girl whose alarmingly inhuman needs and abilities lead her to a startling conclusion. She is in fact a genetically modified 53 year old vampire. Hmm. Wow. I think I have that one. I think that might've been one of the ones that I got. Um, during one of my audible splurges. Oh, yeah, when they do that buy one, get one, or buy Maybe. four or three or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Fledgling, so according to this, so she she had started to write this series called the Parable Series, um, published two novels, later designated as the Parable or Earthseed series to pick the struggle of the Earthseed community to survive the socioeconomic and political collapse of 21st century America due to poor environmental stewardship, corporate greed, and the growing gap between the wealthy and the poor. Luckily, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. Um, right, so she published the Parable of the Sower, which is the first book. And then um, did the parable of the talents, 
And then I think she got really bogged down trying to do other books in the series. And she ended up with writer's block. And I think um, she ended up getting over the writer's block by writing that, that vampire book. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. So, Kindred, my first, just did you guys like it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very much, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but it was. <sighs> wow, I apologize for everybody that I just sighed on. That was really loud. But, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's I I feel so this this is my own hang up, right? I everything right now is so goddamn depressing all the time, right? Yeah. Like yeah. um sometimes I'm afraid to turn on my phone or <laughs> turn on the television. Um like I I'm afraid to turn off of HGTV, which I know will always be white people getting those houses flipped yeah. um, because oh my god what has happened since i went to the grocery store oh it's okay he just goosed the queen or you know something has burned down or they got know, shot or we have we're children are in cages now it's cool it's just like chitty chitty bang bang they all live underground oh, yeah. and the child catcher um you know, hunts him down and puts him in there. Yeah. So um, this book was not a pick me up. <laughs> no, it was. <laughs> no, it was not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's not like when we looked at the premise and it was like, oh, cool, this black woman goes back in time to to uh, you know a plantation. I'm sure this yeah. is going to work out great for her. Um, ah. So, spoiler alert. Not so much. Well, it kind of does. I mean, except for her arm. I mean, she managed to save her family. She did. She saved yeah. her family. She saved her own life. And her husband. And, and her husband. But ultimately, the sacrifice was she lost an arm. Yeah. I mean, and she... The book started, right? <clears throat> yeah. So, so that's... Arm yeah. was embedded in the wall up to... No. Yeah. She just said that she had no arm. <laughs> Yeah, because she wakes up in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. No, and they oh, think her husband, they, they want to know if her husband right. beat her up. Yeah, and the husband has just been released from jail because they yeah. assumed that yeah, she's yeah. that way because of him. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so, um, I mean, so in a way, um, Props to Octavia Butler for writing very nuanced characters. Yeah. Um, like there's nobody who is, there's nobody who just makes good choices and is a tried and true. Nope. I mean, th because Dana, I mean, Dana's, Dana's certainly a good person, but, um, there were many times where I'm like, what? What the hell are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you doing? yeah. So before we get much further, maybe we should kind of set the scene. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um, at the opening of the book, like, uh, like we said, Dana's in the hospital. And uh, at this point, we don't know that her husband is a white man. <clears throat> the only reason I knew at uh, close to this point is because because of the graphic novel, it shows her husband in the room with her and he's a white dude. I was like, oh, she's married to a white dude. That's really progressive in 1976. Yeah, um, and, and so she's in the hospital. She has uh, her left arm is a, you know missing from like the elbow down or just above the elbow down. And the police are trying to figure out what's going on. And, and she's talking to her husband like, yeah, I told them it wasn't you, but you know, I can't, <laughs> how much do you, like, they're not gonna believe anything I say. So we just have to kind of figure it out. Um, and then, then, uh, then we, then we get to the beginning of, of the journey. Um, she's, they're hanging out in their new apartment. Um, and all of a sudden Dana feels kind of, kind of woozy and it's like she passes out. 
she is immediately transported to um, an unknown location and sees that there is a, a boy face down uh, and he's drowning in this river. And the mother is standing on the uh, on the shore on the bank, going, "Oh my God, my baby!" And um, hey, that was pretty good. Thank you. Um, and then she she goes and she gets him, and she starts trying to revive him and get him breathing. And the mom's like, "You get off of him!" And she's yelling at him and or yelling at her and smacking her around. And then uh, she she gets him uh, resuscitated, and, and he's okay. And then she turns around and there's a dude with a gun in her face and she's like, ah, and then essentially she's, she ends up back. Right. And she wakes home. out of Antebellum South and is back in her apartment with her husband. Right. Except she's totally soaking wet. Right. And she's moved. Right. Positions. Yeah. Right. She, and he turns around and he's like, what? How did you get over there? And she's like, <laughs> I don't know. And I just rescued this little red-haired boy from a river. Right. And and um, she had come to find out that she had been gone. She experienced her absence as being about 10 minutes long. He experienced her absence in seconds. Mm -hmm. It was just like, boom, boom. And, yeah. and that was that. Yeah. Um, so she tells him, you know, exactly what happened and um he's kind of like gosh i i mean i don't want to disbelieve you but it's you sound really like a crazy person <laughs> exactly right um and then shortly after that uh it happens again and she is gone for i think it was a couple of hours right mm -hmm. something like right. that and yeah. when she gets back He's, he says she's been gone for, it was like two and a half or three minutes because he checked. Then they're laying in bed. He gets her all cleaned up and dried up and um, whatever. I don't remember which, she had some physical thing going on because she's forever yeah, getting beat up. Yeah, she basically gets her ass handed to her on a regular basis throughout this book. Right. So, so he, he's got her, he's comforting her and um, she's like, I'm packing a bag, right? Because I don't have jack crap when I go back there and I'm completely unprepared. So they pack this bag and they're holding each other <laughs> and then boom, they go, they both go. They both go back. Yeah. And that's yeah. when things really, so what, what we find from the first few, what what come, what happens is she figures out that um, the guy that she's protecting, the boy, and oh, the, oh, so the second time she went back, he had set the curtains on fire in the house. No, right, right. So she, and he's like, oh my God, and a few years have passed. Um, and but it's the same kid that she rescued from the river. Exactly. So it's the same kid. He's aged a few years. She has not aged at all because it's like the same day for her. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she takes the curtains down, makes sure that everybody's safe. And um, oh, that's when she was found by the patrollers. Yeah. So that's when she realized what year it was, mm -hmm. where she was located. She starts talking to this kid and he tells her that his name is Rufus. Um, so now she realizes she is in uh, 19th century Maryland on a plantation. Rufus is the plantation owner's son. Um, and that's the first time Alice is mentioned. And she knows she's figured out that Alice Whalen was one of her ancestors from a book um, that like a her Bible. The, right. fam the family Bible has the, you know, the ancestors written in it, the family tree is written in it, and she's starting to recognize the names that this kid is telling her. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so his name and then his friend, Alice, and she's like, oh, Alice. Okay. Because that's when he tells her, you can go, Alice is a free woman, you a free, you know, free black, her mom is free, <clears throat> go to her house, she'll help you figure out you know, how you can get by until, you know, you go home, whatever. So that's when she figures out that, okay, she still doesn't know yet that 
that Rufus, I don't think is, uh, I don't think she's figured that out yet at this point that Rufus is her ancestor also. Yeah. But that this is a tie to to Alice. Yeah. Right, I think? Yes. Yeah, right? yeah, I think that's right because <laughs> then once she goes back to her present day, she looks at the Bible and she sees that Rufus is her ancestor. Right. right. So she realizes that somehow this red haired kid um, had offspring with you know her her black ancestors who is alice and she meets alice's mother who apparently looks remarkably like dana mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so then when they end up going back together her and, and her husband kevin um that that's where we get even more uh of the story of of alice and i don't recall what the oh he was falling out of a tree Right. Right. So every time Rufus is in danger of dying, yeah. um, Dana is transported to where he is so that she can save him and, and thus save her, her family. Right. Because if Rufus dies, then she, she never exists. Right. So he's the, her ancestor. Right. So there's, and the, 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 the kid that we're waiting for is named Hagar which I could not stop thinking of Hagar the Horrible from the comic strip. Me too. Oh my God. <laughs> well, it's actually a biblical name, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, the, yeah, yeah, because there's so, she made a comment about mm -hmm. um, if he ever reads the Bible and sees the, the source of, of, of all the kids' names. Um, but then we're jumping ahead a little bit. <clears throat> so Dana, through all of these uh, visits, um, before her and Kevin go, she's she's already starting to develop uh, a relationship with with Rufus, who she calls Ruth, and um, you know he he pretty much she tells him at, at uh, pretty early on, you know, this is who I am, this is where I come from, um, right? Because initially, because she shows up wearing pants. <laughs> They right. think that she is a man. Because mm -hmm. she wears jeans. She has Levi's that she wears. And, and she's got very short hair. Um, and yeah, and so she's, everybody, is, she's improper. And, mm -hmm. um, very improper for the time. Right. And now even her parent or his parents, Rufus's parents, now the, the mom, she, she doesn't like Dana, but it's... It's complicated. Miss Margaret is a pain in the ass. She 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 loves her baby boy. Oh my she god. She loves her baby boy. Um she I don't think likes her husband in the slightest. Um and I think um she she I don't know that she really figured out what Dana was uh or who she was and how she was getting there could because Dana doesn't age. Every time they that uh, she, that Dana comes back to the south um, to save Rufus, every the years have passed. There's for, for the antebellum south, years have passed. Right, but, but Dana, it's probably this whole this whole book takes place in about what eight months at the most. No, 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 no. It was it was like eight weeks. It, it was starting eight weeks. Uh, yeah, June's so it's a very short period. You know, eight weeks. Yeah. But every time she goes back. Um, it's just years and yeah, years. People are now. ten years older now, and she comes yeah. back, and it's been a week. And all yeah. of the and the and the slaves, um, they're like, "Oh, Dana, what you doing here? <laughs> you know, what did uh, what did Master Rufus do now? You know." And that's that's exactly how they would react. You know, uh, react to her, and uh, it it became and, and for Dana, it was really I found it really interesting that you know. And, and she talks about it, um, how things like, uh, how being a slave, being owned, being a piece of property, being ordered about um, can, can very quickly become normal yeah. for, for somebody. You know, she, initially she was like, fuck you, I'm not doing all this shit. Sorry, gang. <laughs> um, but, but then she very quickly, you know, she got her ass beat a few times and 
I mean, badly. Very badly. And nearly raped. Right. Nearly but for raped. her, but for her, it was super, super bad. But when they were talking about it, like Ruth's like, well, I mean, you weren't in any danger. And, you know, she's, she is getting whipped with mm. this big leather bull whip. And she mm. is screaming that they're going to kill her. And everybody else around her is just like, no, that wasn't as bad as it could have been. <laughs> it's like, eh, you know, how badly did Alice get beaten? Oh, well, you know, not bad, like you what you got. And she's like, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> but you know so, what I really appreciated is how um, the character was rationalizing certain aspects because every time she went back, she got more and more culturally immersed, right? Even though it was very short, and she started justifying some of the things in her head as to Rufus's reaction or, you know, what was going on. Um, and it was really interesting um, to, to sit back and, and see it or hear it explained from, from that point of view. I thought it was, I thought it was amazing, actually. I, I want to break in. Um, we do have several folks watching. If you want to... Um uh, chat with us so if you have any comments if you've read it and you want to make some comments uh, just type in on the uh, on the YouTube screen there uh, under the, the video and we'll be very happy to include you in the in the discussion yeah don't be shy yeah um, yeah and the more that she got to know Rufus it was like she had this serious almost love-hate relationship with him you know she understood him and his insecurities and you know he but he's he is a product and she said this several times he's i, I believe she did he's a product of of his environment <laughs> and, yeah. and and of his parents and you know she she didn't agree with what he did and she tried to talk him out of of things like selling people and and things like that and and she did make um some impact on him but ultimately he was who he was and and to the point of you know slapping her around or you know even you know about to rape her um, he was the horrible asshole that he was but he also it, he was a very complex character they I all were yeah they all were. everybody yeah, in this book was a, a complex character so yeah. kudos to her for that there were no mm. black and white well you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> yes but like i said earlier there was nobody who was all good and only made good decisions and then there was nobody who was all bad and only made bad decisions like even rufus's father right who initially you think this guy has no redeeming qualities that actually yeah. ends up not to be true i mean mm -hmm. he's still a horrible person but most people in this book are horrible people and i felt like um Right, so so we mentioned that like the third time that she goes back in time, her husband grabs onto her and goes with her. Mm -hmm. So when her life becomes jeopardized again, she, he is not able to get to her. And she comes back to the present and leaves him behind. And yeah. at that point, I was like, oh, shit just got real, right? So, <laughs> so now she comes back to 1976, and her white husband from the 70s is now back in Antebellum Plantation, Maryland, mm -hmm. without her. Mm -hmm. uh, and who knows how long, how much time is going to pass before she is pulled back to that era again and what is basically good going to happen to him and the sense that i got was that the author was basically trying to say um everybody is impacted by their environment mm -hmm. and this guy who you know he's a progressive guy he has married an african-american woman yeah. and that has um driven wedges between he and his family members um, but he's still kind of a misogynist, right? I mean, as far as these characters go, he's one of the good ones. Yeah. Right on the scale. 
Right. But he's still got some issues. Still got issues, right? I mean, he's basically, he's kind of a controlling guy. He's very jealous and very suspicious of his wife. And I mean, like when she, when she comes back from time travel <laughs> for him to be like, did he rape you? Did he put his hands on you? Like, that's what you're worried about, dude. Like <laughs> I'm getting whipped on the regular. Yeah, that that was that was troubling to me. I was like, really, that is what you're concerned about? Well, you know, I won't be upset if really I'm telling you right now that that he didn't have that interest in me. That wasn't what he wanted me for. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you know, if you did. And then first of all, she wouldn't have had anything to say about it. Yeah, true. Right. You know, it, it didn't have anything to do with what she wanted or didn't want. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, you're right. And yeah. So, so even as a progressive character um, who is one of the good ones, um, I mean, he still has his flaws. And then he still has these sort of inexplicable moments of privilege where he's like, it's kind of nice here in the past. Right. <laughs> like, I was going to buy some land and, you know, um, yeah, and, and, you know, he really, one of the things that was really telling is that he, he no longer seemed to, he understood it as an economic issue. And um, it, it wasn't, it, it, well, you know, they would have been sold anyway. And she's like, whoa, 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 I just saved that from happening. Well, I mean, they're going to get sold anyway. So what's, you know, why'd you do that for? Like, he really seemed to either, either he didn't have, um, as much humanity as I thought he did initially, or he lost a lot of it. Um, See, I, I got a sense of what she was saying is, you know, un until you're in that position, you are not going to get the, yeah. pri the privilege that you have. And of course, you know, in the seventies, no one was using the term white privilege or mm -hmm male privilege but i mean you very much get the sense that kevin had both mm -hmm. and seemed really oblivious uh to both yeah. and I, yeah and you know the author did such a great job of i mean she really there you know you know sometimes you, you read a book and the author's all over it Right. You can feel that the author is there. The characters aren't the ones who are conveying these messages. They're not the ones who are necessarily living these lives. But I never felt like that. Like she was completely absent in this book. There was nobody there except Dana telling her story. Yeah. And, and I just it was so easy to become immersed in it. It's true. Yeah, that's very true. And it starts right right from the first words that you either le read or listen to. Yeah, I really appreciated that. Right in, yeah. Yep, that was that was very nice to start listening because you never know. You never know. You may have to hold on for you know two or three chapters or something before you even get. Like, but no, it was like boom, got him, got yep. him. Arm. I was like, cool. <laughs> One thing that I didn't um, that I kind of felt like I was going to call bullshit on was when when she did get back so when so kevin's still in the past she comes back to current time she's there for eight days um and the um when she gets back they had been there for like a few months hadn't they because it was at least eight weeks for they were waiting for rufus's leg to heal Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So they were there for quite a while. And mm -hmm. when she got back, like she said that they had taken pork chops out before all of this started happening to thaw and there was still ice on the pork chops. So, I mean, that's just to illustrate how short of a time uh, it had, it had been. And then once she got back, then it was eight days from the time that she got back after Kevin was left. Yeah. Um, and in that eight days, Kevin had been alone for five years. It had been five years that had passed. Um, and when she shows up, Rufus is in the street getting his ass beat again. Um, there is a Alice, a, gr a grown up Alice is standing in the street uh, with her shirt torn open 
and there is a black man beating the shit out of Rufus. And immediately, see, immediately Dana's like, oh, well, he deserves this ass kicking. If, if what this looks like is what really happened, he totally deserves this whoop down. And, um, and the, the man turns out to be Alice's husband, Isaac. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rufus, when, when she gets him uh, you know, up to talking, it turns out that Rufus wants Alice. He mm -hmm. wanted her voluntarily if possible, but it wasn't going to stop him anymore. He wanted her. He was going to have her, which was really sad because when I, I don't know, I don't know why, I don't know why I thought this, um, but before I started, you know, as soon as it turned out, when she saw that Alice and Rufus were the parents of her great grandmother, I thought that they, maybe they had actually fallen in love. I was very naive in my in my initial assumptions. So when she goes back and sees this scene in front of her, I'm like, why are you jumping to conclusions? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Maybe maybe this dude, maybe this dude who's beating the hell out of Rufus right now, maybe he's also in love with Allison. He didn't like what was going on, but alas it's yeah. not so yes it wasn't so it was not so alice was in love with her husband isaac and rufus wasn't having it he wanted yeah. alice and that yeah. was it so dana talks isaac into not killing rufus mm -hmm. uh, because her ancestor has not been born yet yep and yep. Uh, i don't know when you guys want to take over from that sadly the end result is rufus gets isaac out of the way by selling him so he's got free pass basically now to be with Alice, whether she likes it or not. And don't and they like horribly disfigure him? They cut off his ears. They cut his ears off. They take him back to the, oh, because he, he and Alice, Dana gives them a head start and they're going to try to escape. Now remember, Alice is a free woman, but she's married to a slave. So she tries to help uh, Isaac escape. They're both caught. When they're caught, uh, Alice is nearly beaten to death, and I, uh, I, they, they cut off Isaac's ears and then sell him and enslave Alice. She is no longer a free woman, and now she belongs to Rufus. Yeah, right. The guy who raped her, and yeah. continues to. Uh, and, yep. they, and even their relationship um, and, you know, over the years, you know, Rufus is just convinced that Alice, if she just gives him a chance, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll like him or want to be with him. And Alice is like, fuck this dude. He sold my husband. He enslaved me. He rapes me. Um, mm -mm, no, yeah, it's those not are hard happening. things to get past right think it would be hard for most people to get past it's right. kind of that that perpetuation of the romantic myth that men just need to keep trying right mm -hmm. that they just you know it's it's like the whole oh well you you just haven't met the right man well um i'm just going to keep asking you out until you say yes um or uh, you know you you know i'll just rape you and then you'll see how good i am right, um right. uh it's it's all no you know variations on the same theme right with with alice though as as the years went by and um dana comes back again and she's she's able to get her husband back uh, dana's there for eight months this next time um, and, and during that time, um, she is, uh, she's beaten several times. She's, um, the, the other slaves are pissy with her because she is, uh, like Rufus's pet. She helps Rufus pay the bills. Rufus is like, you know, if, if we don't want to sell, I bet it's a telemarketer. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. If, if Rufus, you know, she comes back and there's slaves being sold 
And she charges right up to Rufus and is like, what the fuck? Why are you doing this? Please don't do this anymore. And he's like, you know what? I don't want to. This isn't what I want to do. But dad's dead and I got bills to pay. And if you don't want this to continue to happen, help me contact these creditors. Help me balance the books. Help me do these things. And she does. And they work together uh, to try and, and make things better. Um, and in the meantime, you know, she's continuing to bond with Alice and Alice like has a schizophrenic <laughs> relationship with, with her, you know, one minute they're, they're like sisters. And then the next minute, Alice is just whooping on her verbally, you know, like nobody else would ever do. Um, and it turns out that, um, I think we find out later that Alice became very conflicted within herself that, you know, that there was a part of her that, that kind of, I don't, I don't even know what the right term to, to, to use would be, you know, to, to care or to get comfort from Rufus. Um, like he made a comment that, you know, after, after you left, this is, this is in between the time when she came back to get Kevin and the last time that she shows up um, that Alice had actually even come to him voluntarily, you know, um, and Alice was, you could, it, it, there was at least uh, one conversation that Dana and Alice had where Alice is like, you know what? I, I, I lost my train of thought, but it was, it was like, you know, I could make it easy on myself, but I don't, it's, it would never be accepted or I can't accept it. Or I forget exactly what it was. Do you guys know which they were sitting in the kitchen, I think in the cookhouse, maybe. Oh uh, yeah. That was a long conversation. You know, yeah. I can't remember the details of it, but I remember that it just, it just felt frustratingly sad, right? Yeah. All these people were in this situation and they're all trapped in their own private hell in some ways, you know? Mm -hmm. and that's, Alice, that's a really good way to put it. Making the only way she felt she could um, to end it. And uh, that, that was really jarring. I, I was sad to see that Alice wound up hanging herself. And uh, yeah, that was tough. I don't know. It just, yeah, it was tough. It was, it really the was. The whole book is tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it is just sort of a detailed study of how shitty we can all be to one another. Yeah. yeah. It was it was definitely a way to personalize an experience that is is so far removed from most of what any of us have experienced personally. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to to drop a, a modern day woman, a modern day black woman into that situation and view it through her eyes and, and the complexity of, of, of slavery in the South when it came to, um, when it came to slaves, when it came to free black people, uh, the precariousness of that, you know, mm -hmm. you're free one moment, somebody rips up your papers and says, oh, now you're not, prove it, right. yeah. you know? Um, and and of the of the slave owners as well. I mean, that she never ever came close to excusing anyone's behavior. Um, you know, as far as the slave owners went, or the the um, the overseer or the patrollers or anything like that. But through Rufus and his dad, um, you did. You know, you got to you got to see that they they weren't one hundred percent evil assholes. You know, for the the conversations that that Tom Whalen had Rufus's dad with uh, with Dana after after a few times of her showing up, and he he was just like, okay, well, go take care of Rufus. That's what you came for. Yeah, it was interesting. That was interesting. And for him to warn her um, after she showed up with Kevin, and you know that why don't you just stay here because you're going to regret it. If you can, if you go off with, with Kevin, because of the story that Kevin had told him that he was just going to sell her, that he tried to kind of protect her from that for whatever reason, he didn't have to do that. You know, I don't, it was, 
It was good. Um, the it, only it was but, really a good book. That's true. And you know, they she never explained the time travel. Never. No. No. But how could? And, and that's good because how could she have? I mean, imagine. You know, it's like I, I'm not going to name the author or the title of the of the book, but um, there's another time travel book I love very, very much, and the author tried, <laughs> tried to explain it, and it was really fell flat. So in this case, I guess it's just use your fucking imagination. Right, <laughs> which is great. I think it's that's the great. best way to handle it because it, it was completely unexplained, unexplainable to her. Yeah, you know, and they didn't even really this, try. Right, you're on this journey with her. The 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 how to fours and whys are immaterial. Really, it's you know this is one woman's quest to save her own life. <laughs> right. that's what it is. Yeah, that's and along yeah. the way you meet people that. You know, are uh, not all like, like you said, not all good, not all bad, product of their time. Um, most of the um, folks, in many ways, were just horrible, horrible, horrible people. But um, it so was just, I enjoyed just it. like now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the parallels are interesting. <laughs> you know, but, I, I, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I would definitely recommend this book. I, I think it really shines some light on. Human nature, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, but don't read it when you're sad. Oh hell no! Which you which would, read this book when you're sad? Which brings me to our next book that now I think we should rethink. We can, yeah. I, I think you know, and it, it, this has been a few months now that Colette's like, I'm, I'm like, gonna slip my wrist, dude. If you read it. <laughs> <laughs> All we're reading about is murder and mayhem and horrible, horrible people. I just don't think I can do it. Um, maybe we pick a, a comedy. <laughs> maybe. You know? Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there'll be some light moments in this book. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we could find the sequel to Killing Cupid. Uh, no! I no, can't, no, no, I can't no. imagine that there is a sequel. Oh, I hope not. In fact, I would think that everyone would have sort of um risen up and confronted that author and told them because at this it's just juncture i can't even remember the gender of the author Look, there were two just, of them there was a dude and a woman yeah just sort of pulled him aside and said hey this is not for you <laughs> <laughs> go don't, back to go write your separate things because don't do this, this was not part. happening this was not good for you <laughs> um yeah, and you know, I. Uh, but again, this this was particularly depressing simply because there were so there's no one um, foe, right? Everybody's pretty awful. Uh, there's a lot of buying and selling of people, and killing people, and raping people. Um, that it's pretty hard to get past. There's no lighthearted moments. <laughs> None that I could remember. There's none. Um, so, you know, if we're just going to move on to, like, the casual serial killer, I could probably do that. I feel like <laughs> that would be a little bit more upbeat. Because <laughs> then, we, then we would go back to, like, there's one bad person, right? And then we, have, we have good people who were trying to, to find that person. So that, that might actually help restore my faith in humanity because I'm <laughs> sure not getting it from, like, current events. All right. All right. So why don't we, we'll stick with that and should, let's tell everybody what book we're going to do. Okay. Um, that way, if you want to uh, participate, read or listen to the book and um, Colette, have you given up on your cocktail? I see you swigging that Mountain Dew down. It's, it's, it's just ice. <gasps> oh, okay. She's so. Yeah, no, that was not swigging. She went, whoop gone <laughs> I, I was a little parched <laughs> oh my, my southern thing yeah so this drink the black eyed susan is like a, a cousin to the mint julep so yeah it was good i don't know that i'll make it again but i did enjoy it i think i got a quarter of it left no my god i have half of it left well, uh -huh. you're just not applying yourself. Uh, I'm I'm miserably. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. So what we've decided to do, our next read. Oh, that's right. We were talking about that. 
Yeah. Um, well, you know, we, we have a tendency to change our minds. We do. So right now, as it stands, we're going to be <laughs> reading or listening to uh, Jar of Hearts by Jennifer Hillier. Um, but, you know, that it's not in stone. I'm just saying. Just throwing that out there. I'm thinking we'll probably go with it. It'll be some good murder and mayhem with, with good people. And I'm betting there'll be a happy ending. I'm hoping there will be, yeah. By, and by happy ending, I mean like no more than 15 people dead and the woman, the woman who's in prison um, for doing it um, will get out after only being psychologically maimed. Right? Yes, I mean, beginning to me, yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds great. So, yeah. it's, <laughs> so it's a, a, a feel good. <laughs> family-friendly, so yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's empowering. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Yes. What, what more right. could we want? So th did you tell them what it is, Jar of Hearts by Jennifer Hillier? I did. I, did. Yeah. I was yeah. pulling yeah. up my nose. did that with her mouth. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't fart the alphabet. So I was like, awesome. yeah, man, that just happened. How did you miss that? <laughs> Sorry, I, really, right. I have to pay attention closer. And you got a virgin drink going on. What the what? I know, right? I know. So, right. Just you've had way too much juice. <laughs> I have to go to the bathroom now. I'm just <laughs> around. All right, well, on that note, before somebody has an accident, um, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. Tell your friends because we appreciate more. Uh, and if you have any book suggestions or story suggestions, please let us know. Um, we're always interested in, in a good read and maybe some comedy, you guys, just to help call it out a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So thanks again, and um, uh, we'll see you next time. All right, bye, bye. everybody. Bye.